Um, okay, I can see people starting to join the webinar. So we're just gonna give everyone um, a second or two. Um, I see Nick has joined. Nick's one of the filmmakers in the series also. So thanks for tuning in, Nick. Okay. Um, okay, well, as people join, I'm going to maybe just start doing some introductory stuff. Um, this is always the part of it where I wish I had like three different computer screens because there are too many things to have all in one place. Um, okay, one second. Um, okay, um, so yeah, okay, my name is Emily and I'm one of the programmers at the Maisel's Documentary Center. Um, and if anyone who's tuning in is unfamiliar with the organization. We are a um, nonprofit micro cinema and education center in Harlem. Um, we screen pretty much exclusively documentaries and experimental films um, under normal conditions or whatever that is in our um, space in central Harlem during the pandemic that has also been online. Um, and we have several education programs um, that teach documentary filmmaking to young people uh, in Harlem and the South Bronx, um, mostly high school students and um, justice involved or formerly incarcerated young people. Um, and um, this, um, well, okay, before I, so <laughs> before I introduce like this conversation and the series that we've been working on um, to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Attica prison uprising, uh, I wanna introduce JT, who is the director of Third World Newsreel, um, who's one of our uh, collaborators on the series, just to say a few words about Third World Newsreel as well. Welcome everybody. Um, I'm JT Takagi and Third World Newsreel is a media center an alternative media center that prioritized media by and about people of color and social justice issues. Um, the organization is in like its 51st year, so it's been around for a while. Um, and we're part of this program in part because uh, one of our films deals with Attica. And we're really honored to be with other filmmakers and activists around this issue because that's what we're about is that it's not just media, but it's what you do with it, the activism that comes along with it. So we're really pleased to be part of this program. Um, we do educational distribution training. Um, and again, as I said, our focus is mostly uh, emerging filmmakers of color. So thank you. Thanks, JT. And I also just want to name a few of our other organizational collaborators on the series, um, the Freedom Archives in the Bay Area, who were just so huge for helping us um, gather material, research, primary documents, um, as well as some film and audio footage that's included in the series. Um, also, the Documentary Forum at City College is um, has been a promotional partner. Um, and then also Maisel's is part of the Attica is All of Us Coalition, which is a group of organizations that are all dedicated to um, commemorating, commemorating the anniversary of Attica um, with an abolitionist and the carceral lens. Um, so they also have an event um, tonight and have been doing a lot of great work around the anniversary. Um, so I guess I wanna just start um, by reading this quote from George Jackson, because I think it was a really um, important sort of framing um, device for the series. Um, it comes from Blood in My Eye, which was the last uh, book that he completed before he was assassinated by prison guards at San Quentin um, in 1971, um, which was one of, I think, the major uh, events that really catalyzed um, a, a lot of prison uprisings around the country and specifically Attica. So the quote is, our whole question is just what level of consciousness will support the violent revolutionary activity necessary to achieve our ends. 
how will we know when this level is reached? And that's from George Jackson. Um, so as many of you listening probably know, um, this week and um, specifically today is the 50th anniversary of the Attica prison uprising, which was when a group of around 1200 um, incarcerated people at the Attica Correctional Facility upstate um, took control of the prison yard um, to protest essentially the um, terrible living conditions. And they had submitted a manifesto of demands several months prior to the prison administration, um, which were continually neglected. Um, and the uprising lasted four days and essentially was squandered when um, the uh, prison warden and Governor Rockefeller at the time sent in state troopers to open fire at prisoners and kill um, about 40 people. So um, we are <laughs> thinking about the anniversary of the Attica prison uprising for from several different perspectives in this series. Um, one is just to think about the role of film and documentation and cultural production in um, the uplifting of social movements against prisons, against police, um, think about the idea of visibility and how film may or may not be able to shed light on aspects of the prison industrial system that um, are visible or that are sort of purposefully invisibilized. Um, and I think that film is a really interesting tool for um, kind of highlighting those contradictions and what we are able to see and what we are not. Um, and then also just more broadly, um, I'm gonna just read this from the end of um, the program copy on our website. Our hope is to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Attica uprising and to reflect on ongoing resistance efforts against prison slavery and police terror. It's to memorialize the political prisoners killed by guards and troopers in 1971 and to grieve the many others killed in the struggle for their and others liberation in the present day. It's to activate film in the fight for a world beyond policing and imprisonment, a world where justice is non-punitive and healing for all people and to support organizers on the inside and out in the fight to dismantle the conditions that produce these structures of violence in the first place. Um, so I can't think of a better group of people to um, have a conversation about these many issues um, and to just sort of reflect broadly on um, our role as abolitionists and filmmakers and organizers moving forward. Um, so before I hand it over to Nikki, um, just like a few, a few things, um, other events as part of the series. Tomorrow, um, we're gonna be probably later in the day uploading a recorded conversation between um, Alex Johnston, who's part of this conversation as well, and um, several members of the George Jackson Brigade, which is a revolutionary group started in Seattle in the 70s, um, who were influenced by George Jackson's um, uh, sort of guerrilla warfare tactics um, and militant organizing. And then on Thursday, we are doing an in-person screening of Cinda Firestone's Attica at Maisel Cinema um, on 16 millimeter. That's at 7.30 and is suggested donation um, at the door. There are pre-sale tickets available online. And then on Friday, we're doing an outdoor screening on the sidewalk of Alex's Evidence of the Evidence and Nick McDonald's um, Still Attica Remains on 16 millimeter. And um, the filmmaker Nick McDonald will be in attendance um, outside of Maisel Cinema to do a, a post-screening Q&A. Um, and also we made these zines um, <laughs> and there are some left. So if you come to the screenings on Thursday and Friday, you can get one. Um, and uh, yeah, if you have any questions during the conversation, feel free to put them in the chat or the Q&A feature. And that is a lot of things. And so I'm gonna read our amazing panelists' bios, and then turn it over to Nikki, who will be moderating. Um, okay, so um, Brett Story, who has a uh, film Prison in 12 Landscapes as part of this series, is an award-winning filmmaker, writer, and activist based out of Toronto. Her films have screened in theaters and festivals widely, including CPH Docs, South by Southwest, Hot Docs, and Sheffield Doc Fest. She is the director of the recent films, The Prison in 12 Landscapes and The Hottest August, and the author of the book, Prison Land Mapping Carceral Power Across Neoliberal America. She is assistant professor of image arts at Ryerson University, and her work has received support from the Sundance Institute and the Guggenheim Foundation. 
um, Alex Johnston, whose film Evidence of the Evidence is part of the series, is a documentarian, media maker, and media scholar. He received his master's degree in social documentation from the University of California, Santa Cruz, and his PhD in film and digital media, also from UC Santa Cruz. His research and creative work examines the politics and aesthetics of documentary and new media practices with an emphasis on histories of race, class, and gender. His scholarship has been published in a number of academic and art forms, including Docalog, the Journal of Sport and Social Issues, Insight Journal of Experimental Media, and Insight Journal of Experimental Media. His films and gift cycles, including Way Down in the Hole, Now Again, Races, President, and Evidence of the Evidence have screened at a variety of venues, including the Berlinale, Indy Lisboa, Walker Art Center, San Francisco's Other Cinema, and the Miners Colfax Medical Center, a convalescent home for retired hard rock and coal miners in Rotten, New Mexico. Alex is also the managing editor of the Rat sorry, managing editor of the Radical Online Media Journal Now, a journal of urgent praxis. He teaches filmmaking at Seattle University, where he is assistant professor of film. Um, and Kevin Steele is an abolitionist filmmaker with Root and Branch, uh, which is an organization formerly known as Incarcerated Workers Organizing Committee in New York City, um, as well as campaign, campaign to bring Mumia home and a member, member of the Media Committee for the Spirit of Mandela. Formerly captured and having begun organizing while inside, Kevin helped with the 2016 nationwide prison strike and other resistance efforts. Upon his release, he has been part of numerous actions against, against prison slavery and hyper-incarceration from the 2018 nationwide prison strike to the upcoming tribunal in October. He continues to organize in his Bronx neighborhood with youth basketball tournaments and the sharing of other opportunities he was deprived of. Um, so we have these amazing, amazing organizers and filmmakers in conversation. Um, moderated by Nikki Franco, who is a Caribbean abolitionist, community organizer, multidisciplinary cultural worker, writer, podcaster, and facilitator of spaces for collective study. Seeking to disrupt the bureaucratic frameworks of academia and transactional ways in which relationships exist under capitalism, Nikki's work experiments with truth-telling, radical history and thought, and revolutionary imagination. Nikki also curates educational and cultural programming that navigates the current urgency on global solidarity and environmental and ancestral preservation. She is the creator of Hashtag Nude in America, a photo series challenging notions of which bodies are acceptable in natural landscapes and national parks, while offering decolonial and anti-capitalist stories of these spatial captures. Nikki is currently based in Miami, Florida, where she serves as the political education director for FemPower MIA and civic engagement organizer for Power U Center for Social Change. From 2019 to 2021, Nikki served as the founding director for FemPower Miami Community Bail Fund. Um, so yeah, Nikki, I will turn it all over to you. Thank you all for being here. Ooh, thank you, Emily. Thank you for a super generous um, opening. Um, super, super, super grateful to be um, commemorating this 50th anniversary. Um, I think there is such a powerful, it is such a powerful tool to use film, to use storytelling, to use archival work to help our folks and our communities be able to actually imagine what the new world can possibly taste like and feel like and look like. So just deep, deep gratitude to be in this conversation with all of you today. Um, and I think just to start our conversation in like a true celebratory commemorating fashion, I would love to hear from each of y'all sort of like, what are each of you celebrating in relationship to, yeah, our work of like shattering cages and making abolition more possible on this sort of like historic day? Um, Brett, I don't know if you wanna kick us off and we can kind of just go around. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, I will also just express my gratitude. Um, I mean, I, I'm grateful for all of you and the work that you do. And I just, you know, in part, like, I feel like we need, we, the, the folks at, who rose up at Attica would be celebrating the work that you all are doing. And we should, um, we should join those celebrations together. Cause I think there's a lot of defeat in this world and there's a lot to feel angry and upset about and the fact that ordinary people 
who desire freedom will work with each other to get freedom and get free is something that we should name and talk about every day. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, that's just something I, I, you know, I've been thinking about, I, I find it, you know, recently a few political prisoners were commuted by, um, not so prisoner friendly outgoing governor, um, Cuomo, um, and I want to celebrate, it was far too few, but I want to celebrate those victories because activists on the inside and outside um, fought for them and won. And um, we need to remind ourselves when we win um, because that we can build um, from those victories. And yeah, I just, I think it's like always really important on this day. It's a, it's, and this, this weekend of the anniversary of Attica, um, you know, I heard, I saw um, a longtime abolitionist Craig Gilmore um, post something that said, you know, we, we can focus on the repression, we can focus on the, the massacre that happened, but to honor those um, people who rose up, we should be celebrating, you know, what they achieved. It's remarkable, the courage, um, the unwillingness to accept injustice, racism, brutality, not just for themselves, but that was, you know, <laughs> That uprising was an anti-imperialist uprising, um, among other things, and uh, they were those those prisoners were demonstrating solidarity even while they were fighting for their own freedom, and and that's something I try and remind myself of and think about um, this during this few days every September. Alex, do you want to go next? I was wondering, Kevin and I were kind of facing off there, like, all right, who's going to unmute? Um, yeah, I mean, that was also beautifully said, Brett. And um, I do feel, uh, I feel really honored to just be a part of this group, to be honest, and, and the amazing work uh, that you all are doing. Obviously, we this is the first time we've met virtually, but doing that kind of research prior, um, really exciting. And, and personally, I, I'm in like this uh, really wonderful production mode about my next film. Um, and uh, about this group, the George Jackson Brigade, who we're doing a conversation tomorrow. And I've just, uh, it's been so special getting to spend uh, very much the last few months since COVID eased a little bit, really digging in with them about the future. Um, and as we'll get into the films, but my film, I think in some ways was made some years ago and doesn't do some of that imagining that I have sort of, I feel like I've turned a corner uh, because I've started to realize and feel how vital it is to move past mourning and to move past that feeling of like, um, kind of un, um, unresolved uh, tragedy and and horror and you know um, uh, and so so I think yeah getting to talk to them about what, where they were at and where they're trying to go in the future and thinking about what a film about the past that is actually forward looking in that way can be about and I think Attica is an amazing opportunity to do that um, especially you know going back into Firestone's hearing 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 exactly what was being asked for what was being called for. Uh, by the Attica brothers, you know, is 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 really important to me. Um, so I guess that's where I am: I intergenerational solidarity uh, and resistance. Yeah, Kevin. <laughs> yeah. Um. So I do appreciate being on this. This is super dope. Like me, like being like a new filmmaker, being around this is even just amazing. Knowing that it's people out there that does both, that do birth and not just like for money and stuff like that. But for me, um, it's not really a celebration in, in my in my um, monster or anything. It's really just about a remembrance and a commemoration where we acknowledge the, um, the stuff that these brothers went through and we continue to fight as well. Being um, formerly incarcerated, even like before I went to jail, actually, like we always heard about Attica, the Attica riot. In my neighborhood, we constantly heard about it from being from New York, from Soundview. And it was like fascinating. You were trying to figure out what was they doing, why they do it, and and all these like aspects of coming to me. And then finally being captured, you started hearing like real personal information and insight from people that was actually in Attica and those that was just like around other people. And knowing that I could be a part of this for the 50th anniversary is like, wow, that's that's amazing to me. So I'm definitely want to be a part of it and just feel as much as I know from being formerly incarcerated and just like the stuff that they went through and a lot of that stuff is getting taken away and you just gotta like continue to fight. And that's really about it. 
Yes, thank you all so much for just sharing all of like those seeds that were, you know, sort of nurturing in different ways right now. Um, and Kevin, I also want to really like affirm what you shared, you know, like we sort of commemorate what these folks and their, their legacy of their bravery and their courage and their organizing their resistance. And we also know that there's a long, long, long way ahead that we've actually not been able to completely dismantle the cage and the chains and all of this, right? Like we know we're very much so in that, uh, in that sort of legacy and lineage. Um, and I think something I want to talk about with you all is that I think especially coming out of 2020, you know, an uprising where millions of people across the country are um, sort of sharing, um, you know, slogans of defund the police, people are rethinking safety, you know, um, all of this is kind of coming to a head, sort of in the in a crisis that's exacerbated by the COVID pandemic and kind of like disaster capitalism, right? I think now here we are a year later, and I know folks like us and folks that we're in community with are still continuing to talk about the role of policing, the role of jails and prisons. Um, so I'm curious to hear from each of you all sort of like how y'all are making sense of the contradiction that here we are 50 years after the Attica uprising. And in some ways, one can argue that abolition is as popular as it has ever been in this country and at the same time we know that our folks are as incarcerated as ever um and yeah I would just love to hear kind of like how y'all are making sense of that contradiction especially how it may relate to your work your storytelling and sort of folks that you're in community with I guess I'll go since I'm muted first um, I, I do want to start with like a little um a brief history on how I even got into this. So, um, when I was incarcerated, I, I went to jail at 17 years old, and they charged me as an adult for my first time ever for a fight. They um they gave me 10 years, and inside here, inside the um facility, I've I was introduced to a few brothers that was a part of the Nation Gone to Earth, and different other like organizations where I felt like they had a lot of information and just the way they speak, right? I'm, I'm 17 years old, the way they spoke, it was attractive and it was just something I, I felt. And that was like my introduction to just being a political person. I've met um, Malcolm X while I was in prison, Huey Newton, Dr. Huey Newton, and a lot of other these um, brothers and sisters that I've met while I was inside. And it was when I got to Eastern Correctional Facility in New York is where, um, at the time, it was IWOC, um, Incarcerated Workers Organizing Committee. They was doing a lot of um, inside organizing, inside, outside organizing. And they wrote this individual at this time where I was organizing at the same time. I didn't know IWOC at, at this time, though. And the brother brought the information to me and was basically saying that I think it was a mistake because I don't organize. I think they meant to bring it to you. So I, I got in contact with IWOC, which now is Root and Branch, and we continue to work. Um, we continue to work through our process through there. And basically, it was really just a, a good thing, right? It was it was a different understanding of where I came from, my own past life, like street organizing and everything. And, to, and then to like jump into like the Black Panther Party and I understand like um, the brother Fred Hampton, how his ideas and how his ideology was to, to get those people in the street organization to politicize them and to continue to like to grow. Cause these are the soldiers, right? These are the ones that didn't have like this um, notion of following this capitalist rules, right? They don't, we didn't have this idea, right? So we was fearful at this time if um, Fred Hampton knew this and a lot of brothers knew this and a lot of brothers and sisters knew this. And I was a part of that. And reading this information and reading this information really like helped me feel like, okay, I'm not just a person that's just angry, that's just angry, right? Angry with a missed cause and not understanding why I'm angry, right? And I'm sorry, I keep reading, I've seen, it's so much going on right now. But um, yeah, so at this time, right, I'm reading all this stuff and I'm getting the information, I'm getting the knowledge and this is more, I'm, I'm learning more about the Attica uprising. And now I'm learning that brothers, they fast on September 9th every year, which is not even September 9th and through, um, September 13th. And this is not something that 
um, publicized really about the discipline that's still 50 years later, that's still installed inside these facilities upstate New York, whether uh, throughout the country period, because the whole Attica um, uprising came from the California um, prison systems with um, Comrade George Jackson from his assassination. So just knowing all this and continuing to learn it was really like something that helped me in my journey and continues to help me out here to this, um, to this day. I'm not too sure if I even answered your question, but I would, I could keep going. I mean, I think, I think that's beautiful. I think that's affirming. And I think, yeah, I mean, we just talking. So I really yeah. appreciate you sharing all of that. And just like, yeah, just like taking the time to walk us through kind of like your own intimate process yeah. of like coming to this politic um, and like all your relationships while you were on the inside. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess for me, I'm just curious again, I think just the question and it's open for all of y'all, however it may resonate is like how y'all are making sense of the fact that like abolition as a, as a theme, as a topic is arguably as popular as ever come, you know, especially coming out of 2020. Um, but at the same time, we know that incarceration is as, you know, as punitive as ever as at the same time. And all of us are committed to sort of dismantling that system. Um, so yeah, I'm just curious how y'all are making sense of that, kind of like the feelings that make him up, kind of, yeah, how y'all are moving through that very huge contradiction. I can jump in, let, let Brett, Brett deal uh, with Wallace. Um, but well, sorry, now I'm gonna do the same thing Kevin just did, because but it's in reference to, to one of the first things you said, Kevin, in, in the introductions. And maybe this fits into the question a little bit, but. Um, I've been thinking a lot lately about there's this famous wobbly or like the, the international workers of the world, uh, old radical union, and they had a slogan, uh, which probably most of you heard, don't mourn, organize. And, and I've been thinking about that recently um, as maybe not totally correct. And that for me, uh, maybe it needs to be uh, mourn, organize. Um, and that when you actually sort of like close off that process, that actually you, you kind of close something out about um, you know, what drives us to, to, to fight for a better world. Um, so I don't know, I was thinking about it, Kevin, when you were saying like, it's not always about celebration or not necessarily about celebration, it's about commemoration and, and commemoration can be kind of partly an act of mourning, but, um, but not to derail Mickey, uh, that, that initial question, which is the contradiction, which I don't know, for me, I feel like um, the mainstreaming of abolition is such a new like revelatory moment in the last couple of years. Um, and I remember feeling like the tendrils of that with abolish ice and thinking like, is th like that was the first sort of mainstreaming of, I feel like that put that concept on the map. It was of course immediately appropriated and, 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 and hollowed out by like democratic senators or whatever bullshit, but you know, um, but this idea of that, that phrase on people's lips. And so then moving into last spring, um, it's affected me as, as a filmmaker. Like I have this short film that I picked up again and, was was always an abolitionist film but is like much more stridently so because i feel like it can be heard and understood and i and so i feel like we are hopefully i mean a hope a a, a, a a positive take on this is that we're actually at the beginning of of like an abolitionist journey in a sense uh not to say that there hasn't been decades of struggle before that right um uh towards that but in terms of the kind of first like pricking of the ears of a, of a more mainstream uh consciousness so to me it feels like that that we're, or maybe it's not the beginning but we're like at a turning point hopefully and that so maybe as makers and as activists that this is a point when maybe we really need to like get our foot on the gas um because the contradictions are still so glaring um but at least there is like some idea of maybe the overton window shifting and some uh, ability to accept that like oh wait maybe you can't reform prisons you know like maybe that's not actually like a thing you can or should be doing but you know, they just need to be um, torn down, right? Um, so I'll leave that there. Hi, I'm so sorry. I have a screaming kid <laughs> we might hear. Um, but this is such an important question. And I just, I really appreciated hearing Kevin and, and Alex just now. I mean, I think I, you know, I think about this on a lot of different levels. Like on the one hand, I think like, it's not a contradiction to me. I mean, the, 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 you know, the, I feel like the question is always like, why, why isn't abolition yet mainstream? Why wasn't it before? There's a, there's a way in which we, it reminds us about uh, that just so much ideological work goes into convincing 
all of us or many of us every day that capitalism is good, that um, people should be in cages, all of these things, I think we don't actually make any sense. Um, and I mean, don't make any sense and don't, and certainly don't um, represent a, a sort of vision of the world that anyone could really justify living in. And so to the question becomes like, how do those things become accepted? And so when there's these moments in which that sort of common sense, that sort of, you know, kind of delusion that the world as it is, is the way it has to be, get get pierced. I, I think of that as just um, like uh, a, a representation of the knowledge that we all already carry around, you know, the alienation we all already carry around to various degrees uh, around living in a, you know, in a, such an unjustly um, inhumane system of violence. Um, that said, I mean, I think that there's like another question that, you know, I think is part of your your question, Nikki, which is like, I mean, A, is abolition mainstream? Like, I think it's very, very generational. So there's a way in which it's really caught on with younger people. Um, and that's both really exciting. <laughs> you know, you don't seem like crazy for talking about abolition, but also I think it's really important to maintain that abolition isn't just a position, it isn't just the right like way to think, but it's a work, it's a practice. And I think that's what abolitionists have always taught me, the people on the inside, the people on the outside that are doing the work is that abolition is, is world building. So it's not as simple as just saying, prisons shouldn't exist, we shouldn't lock up other human beings inside cages, but it's to say like, why do we, what kind of problems get resolved? Um, what work do prisons do for the system at large and what needs to be transformed within that system in order for, um, you know, in Angela Davis's words, for prisons to become obsolete. And I think like reminding part of the, part of the work of making sure that even the concept of abolition maintains um, the sort of like radicalism <laughs> that it, it um, the spirit of radicalism that it's always had is is also like making sure that we're we're talking about abolition as a practice and not just as a position and um i do think we have to become vigilant you know i think that there's a way in which like like a lot of things like black lives matter like a lot decolonialism there's a way in which that language gets appropriated it becomes a business brand all sorts of things um not just by liberals but by conservatives and i think that we um it's it's part of the work to to maintain that no like you you don't get to you don't get to say you're an abolitionist when actually you're not doing the work of transforming the world and the system that makes prisons possible yes Woo. feel feel so much of like what all of y'all have offered and put forth um and one of the things that comes to mind i think hearing you brett on this final note, like the sort of co-opting and com commodification of, of this sort of work, of this sort of practice of this framework um, also feels like a very real danger in this moment, right? And again, I think to y'all's point, like this is to be expected, right? Like capitalism is gonna, and the market will like shift and bend its full to respond to whatever it needs, you know, to the moment and sort of um, do what it needs to do. Um, but I am curious, like, you all as filmmakers, as activists, as organizers, um, what are y'all seeing particularly, like what are the oppor the unique opportunities in this moment? And I really appreciate Alex, you you spoke to this. So Kevin, like now that there is this sort of landscape of people, some people, sector of the population being a little bit more open to like, okay, it seems like there's a problem mass incarceration. Okay, maybe abolition's like a thing. How is that impacting y'all's film work and storytelling directly? Um, just like, are y'all taking risks that you wouldn't in the past? Are y'all kind of being, you know, moving similarly? Like, how does that texturally impact y'all's work? Is that for me? I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, um, it hasn't, it, it hasn't really changed my like um my work or anything because I was I was an inside organizer as well. So a lot of my peers and family and everyone 
they seen um the process. They seen me um actually studying and continuing to organize it, and they actually watched the growth from what I want for us. So I really don't really know. I would just like to um I did want to say something though about because capitalism and just the word abolition keeps um thrown out and it was something that um, that just came to my mind where abolition is it, reform and abolition. I was reading something um George Jackson once stated about different avenues to get um get to the end goal. I'm paraphrasing really, but he's basically saying that we don't all have to take the same route to get to where we have to go, right? And I've worked with people that do, that do reform, even though I don't really. That's not my thing because I believe that the revolution should be, uh, uh like a a violent and aggressive thing. A revolution should be aggressive. So, and I don't really feel reform does that, but they have um they have tactics as well that continue to get to um that gets to the end goal, and that's the, the betterment of people in the world, right? And it's just my idea is that abolition works, right? Because on prisons, right? So speak on prisons. I might ramble a little bit, but. To speak on prisons, right? Because this is something that was in my mind, and I was talking about my wife, my wife earlier about this, about why why do we have them? What is the idea of it, right? Where did it come from? Why do we continue to have it? And what's the purpose of it? And this is these these are questions I ask reformists and different other people that really don't understand the work that I do and see their answers, right? And it's another question that gets out there, like, what do we do with the rapists and the murderers and the violent offenders and things that way? And my answer is always the same thing we do with those the so-called veterans that come back from Vietnam or Afghanistan. We we help them. They over there killing and raping as well. And we don't we don't criminalize them. We send, we bring them back over here and we help them because it's a mental thing. It's a mental problem that's going on in this whole country. It's a mental problem that's going on and it's not being addressed. It's we're just constantly being thrown into prison, which is really like it's it's just a a upgraded version, just a newer name of what slavery once was, right? This is why we continue to say prison slavery. And that those um notions will continue to like try to push the media to get the um to get the people in the masses to understand that prison is just a extended version of chattel slavery. And until we um really understand that and why, right? And why we we have this like problem with abolishing it. Then I think like more of like my 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 work will get more of an understanding and people that I'm attracted to and people I'm connected with continue to um help as possible as best as possible. Yeah, um, yeah. That, I mean, that's a great question, Nikki. And I'm just uh, trying to think about whether or not I feel like it has changed either my art practice or, or my organizing. And in some ways, yes, in some ways, no. Like, I, I sort of feel like, um, you know, my, my own, especially my film practice, you know, I, I don't, I don't know who necessarily will find my films. Um, I certainly don't see film as playing the same role as activism. So I don't, I just, I don't use like, I don't use my films to sort of just um, send a message or advocate for a position, but they're informed by a politics and those things feel, feel different. And so, you know, there've been people I've encountered when I've showed prison and 12 landscapes who've said, you know, but it has such a radical politics and yet like the film itself is so oblique and poetic and you don't always give people enough information. Like, don't you think that there's a risk that people aren't going to get it? And my feeling is that like people get things on a lot of different levels. And sometimes people don't necessarily have like an analysis, but they feel a gut instinct that things are wrong or they feel not okay in the world. And, and for, in, from different ways, I mean, they might feel not okay in the world because they face like really acute oppression in their life and housing insecurity and, and those kinds of things. And then there's people who just, you know, like who, who might enjoy class and race privilege, but who feel a, just an, an ongoing unease, like know somehow in their, in their bodies and in their lives that their own privilege is not okay and is not um, does not beget a happiness or justice. So I, I think that there's a way in which like art can um, and cinema can can speak a language that's sort of subtextual and reach people 
even if they don't totally know exactly what they think, even at the end of it, they, it, it sort of just produces the desire to, to think more and to talk more. Um, but I also, I also teach and I also organize. And I do think that there's something, there is obviously something really useful about something being like in the air. So for like abolition and to be in the air means that a, the conversation can start um, in another place. And so there's more, it sort of, it allows you to begin further along and to build on that. Um, and it also, I mean, I believe in mass mobilization, you know, and coalition building. And so it, it, it also allows the possibility that you bring more people in that you might not have at another point in time. And then you have to still do the work of being like, okay, well, what does this mean? You say you're an abolitionist, you've heard of abolition, your friends are abolitionists, but what does that mean? Like, can we talk about um, what needs to change in the world? So I do think, I think that it, I think the sort of way in which there's a kind of growing consensus, especially among young people who do not, you know, who, who themselves live the contradictions really acutely right now, the contradictions of debt, the contradictions of climate catastrophe, the contradictions of mass police brutality, um, and, 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 are con and are doing that work already to like connect all those dots. And that's an opportunity, that's an organizing opportunity because you can start the conversation already like up there and build. Yeah, I think I, I just think about conversations I have with my students and with people who are also working with younger people about, I mean, broadening that out to just sort of uh, anti capitalist discourse like writ large and where our starting point is now with with young people uh, sort of, or, or at least the mass of them per class is so different than it felt like it even was five or 10 years ago. So I do feel like there is that kind of thing. And I talked about that a little bit with my film, um, sort of change, being able to like go more forcefully um, into that into that space. Um, but I was thinking, cause I, I teach I teach prison and 12 landscapes a lot. And I taught it, taught it back to back quarters last, last year. And so was thinking about something that I'm not good at. I'm, I tend to get pretty, uh, propaganda, but like Brett, what I loved about that, what I love about that film and for my students is it causes them to lean in, right? It's like that, the, the, the subtleness, that sort of obliqueness, um, uh, you know, compels people to have to ask those questions in the space that you leave for that. And I think that's, because that's what you want, right? You want people to, to, to come to places on their own. Oh, you know, you don't want it to be sort of about dogma. Um, and so I think, yeah, I mean, I think that's a really an important kind of point you made about what what your work does and hopefully even though i do get kind of uh uh propagandist that i hope my work does a little bit make some space for for uh you know free thinking um but, but the last thing thinking about what you were saying kevin which at least personally for me um and this is just my whole life uh has been the, the role of history in these conversations and for me that's been a lot of my passion as a maker and i think as, as an activist but is like figuring out how you f make space for conversations about the past and, and also structural conversations about history. Um, so understanding that continuum you speak of and thinking about it both um, as, as the continuum, but also in its specificity. And that like, I don't know, I just think that to me is, is everything and not in the kind of reductionist, like we're doomed to repeat the past if we don't learn it, but the, like it's deeper than that because it's more structural and like, and so it's really important for people to understand like, you know, uh, th that direct lineage legally, you know, um, uh, or from like Texas kind of slaveocracy into Texas prisons into what we have now, et cetera. So I, I, I just really appreciate what you're saying about that with like history and figuring out how we also bring that out in our work um, as makers and, and as activists, so. So much there. <laughs> Thanks, y'all. Um, I think something that's sitting at the top of my mind, just hearing all of y'all kind of talk and share is kind of like, again, ab abolition is not just like a thing we say or something you put on your like website or like this, this cute thing, really like it's a, it's a discipline, it's a practice, it's a strategy, it's a tactic. Um, and also I think it's not just, and you know, and I think of Ruth Wilson Gilmore on this, like it's not just about getting rid of the cages and getting rid of, of the prisons and the police, but really like, what is the new world we're building and what are the, what it, 
what is it that we're really affirming in this new world? And I think Kevin, you know, of course, the question we all get, like, what do we do with the horrible people, the murderers? Um, and I think for me personally, like over the years and also working with young people, it's been incredibly healing and transformative to also move through those. Those are really painful and personal com conversations when we know that harm is sort of the norm, right? In most of our communities um, and that we've been forced to sort of normalize a lot of this and that the only way we deal with it is kind of like getting rid of folks and just like, you know, locking them up and throwing out the key. Um, but I think for, you know, as we get ready to, close our conversation. Um, yeah, what is what are the sort of life affirming practices in your work and your art? Um, you know, just in all of the things that you all do, I think y'all are very multidisciplinary. So I'm just like all the things y'all do. Yeah, like, what is that life affirming um, process looking like? Right? Um, yeah, how's that manifesting for each of you? Oh, it's such a, um, it's a, that's such a good question, a necessary question. Um, you know, one of the things I get asked a lot just is just like, I mean, and you guys probably do as well, like when you commit to doing work around, you know, abject poverty or um, police brutality or the violence of the prison system, like people can be like, isn't that really depressing? Like, how do you like deal with that day in and day out? And for me, like, I have a really, I mean, you know, I believe in organizing and I have political commitment and I have a politics that comes out of life experience and also just like principles, but also it's like really, you know, selfish, like organizing is an antidepressant, <laughs> right? Like, you know, and, and one of the reasons among many that I have gotten involved in prison organizing, you know, at this point for 20 years is because prisoners, um, formerly incarcerated people, their loved ones are the hardest working, most committed, um, least bullshit um, people I have ever, ever, ever had the privilege of meeting. And I, it is a gift. It is a gift to be privy to that work. Um, and it is life affirming. <laughs> like it is life, you know, it just, it is like, I, 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 I don't find working on prison issues depressing. I, I, I try to imagine my life without that, you know, without that consciousness or without that work or without those relationships. And I think that is a depressing life. Um, that is, um, that, how could I not feel despair? And so this is, this is my antidote to that despair is to keep close to the people that are doing the work that, you know, and, and close to that kind of generosity and courage every day. I guess I'll go. Um, I'm a firm believer in when once I um meet out my um, my ancestors, I would love for them to say that you did your job and you did everything that you had to do, and that's really what keeps me motivated because we're we're not gonna be here forever, right? These these this is reality, and I don't want to get there. And I left so much behind that I didn't I didn't help when I could have I could have um, contributed in any way. So this is what motivates me. It's definitely depressing as hell. I will not, I'm like opposite of Brett. I'm, this is a stressful thing for me as well because it's, it's new. And and it's really the, it's just the common sense. I, it's may, it may not be common sense, but it's just the blatant disrespect that this government continues to put out towards us. And it's, it's just like, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Like prison is supposed to be the rehabilitation facility, but you get charged for um not making your bed. You get charged twenty five dollars a um search charge for not making your bed in the morning. Is that really it it's just like it, it doesn't make sense. And even though I love doing this, right? Cause I love meeting people that's that, that has like like minded minds and can um, continue to educate me and teach me. But it's like how many times are we gonna do this? How many times are we gonna continue to have panels, tribunals, marching and all these other avenues to organize and different ways to make this um, country better or just just help and we always constantly get backlash it's just like it's 
it's weird. It's it's definitely stressful, but we have to do it, right? We have kids. We have we have those that's coming after us, and there's people that died, right? Brother Malcolm, all the Panthers, they were supposed to fight. They was the Cold Time Pro really did a number on our community. Reagan, all these people did a number on our community, and it's it's just like it's not me doing my justice if I just sit back and not help as best as possible as I can, whether it's through film or whether it's through like basketball tournaments in my neighborhood, keeping the kids out of trouble and speaking to them and actually like showing them that yeah, um, I've done 10 years and it was for nothing. And now I have some information and it wasn't just like they, um, it was something I was a bad kid or anything. It's really just a capitalist mindset where they need to fill these beds up inside these facilities. So it doesn't matter what you do, right? And, and like I said before, like from the slave coast to the black coast, people was getting locked up for just walking. People getting locked up for cur- past curfew, even the parole system now, the probation system, all of this bullshit. It doesn't make sense why as a grown man or a grown woman, I got to be home at eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night. And if I don't, I go back to jail. Not because I did anything that was deemed like a criminal or um, criminality or anything. It's just because I went to the store at 909 and the police stopped me. So it, it, it doesn't make sense, right? It really doesn't make sense on why it is prisons and jails and all these things. So I'm, I, I'm just going to continue to fight and we're going to continue to work. But it's definitely a stressful. I won't lie about that. And But somebody got to do it. That's what I was doing. Um. Yeah, I, I was going to say my dog brings me joy, but you know, <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, it makes me think of like uh, Gramsci is like a thing about pessimist and thought and optimist and action. And, and so I do feel like it's about those connections. And for me, I think I said earlier, but I, but just reiterated, I, I feel I get I just get a lot of strength from uh, intergenerational like work and, and community. And so um for me, again, it's it's these elders, but then also uh, my students that I teach and uh, work with and just feeling, um, you know, feeling it's their world um, in a sense uh, and and feeling very excited by by getting into like really uh, deep conversations and thinking about the like world building with them essentially, you know, um, and feel really sort of honored to get to do that and enlivened um, and um, yeah, I mean, and and seeing how they're how they're angry, and then they're and and then they're and then they're doing something with that anger. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they're they're organizing, they're doing the work, they're having the conversations, they're thinking critically, they're thinking structurally. Um, and yeah, I mean, every every week when I'm teaching, the right before I'm like, oh, I'm so exhausted, I'm so tired, and then f- whatever five hours later, I get spit out of the Zoom hole, and I'm just like, oh wait, I'm so excited about you know, these young people and what they're doing, so. Can I just add a quick shout out too? I think on this uh, anniversary, it's a good time to also give a shout out to those six Palestinian prisoners who just escaped uh, the fortress that they were subject to in the Israeli prison. Um, And again, people wanna be free. They'll get themselves free. We'll get ourselves free. Again, in the the words of Miriam Kaba. So shout out to them. Absolutely. Oof, y'all. Um, Alex, I feel you. I feel like I'm coming out of like a Zoom universe, but I feel also super energized um, just like after having really just hearing you all process and like dream um, and remind me why it is that we do this. Um, Kevin, I think even if it's incredibly challenging and it really stretches us and like forces us to like flex muscles, we didn't even know we're there. Um, but you know, we, we have a responsibility and we have a commitment um, to life, to our ancestors, to our people um, and to future generations. And I'm in deep, deep, deep gratitude that we got to just be in this virtual space together on the 50th anniversary of the Attica uprising. Um, just feels very cyclical. And I think for me as a reminder um, to continue in like rigorous discipline of the work that we do um, and to continue building like these constellations and connections um, with folks. Um, so I just wanna extend my, my deep, deep, deep gratitude for spending the virtual evening together. Um, I believe I'm gonna pass it back to Emily, um, but thank you all so much. Thank you, Nikki, for those amazing questions and for the work that you do as well. Um, yeah, thank you so really much. Wonderful hour. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much, um, Alex and Nikki and Kevin and Brett. 
um, just for sharing all of your personal reflections and um, about the relationship between your organizing and your art practice and um, just how we think about our abolitionist politics and tactics and um, organizing moving forward. So I think it's given everyone lots to think about. Um, the films in the series are really extraordinary. I would really recommend um, if people watching haven't watched them yet, um, they're all online for free through September 20th. Um, there's Teach Our Children, Attica, Still Attica Remains, George Jackson, San Quentin, Evidence of the Evidence, The Prison in 12 Landscapes, and an audio album called Prisons on Fire, George Jackson, Attica, and Black Liberation. Um, yeah, so thank you everyone for tuning in. I do want to say one thing before, like, we hang up, if that's okay. Yeah, go ahead, please. Okay, I appreciate that. Yeah, um, so <laughs> I, um, I'm working with the Spirit and Me of Mandela campaign, as well as Jericho and, and the campaign of Ben Romir. And we're working on this tribunal October 22nd to the 25th, where we're charging the U.S. government with genocide. And it's just, and it's, it coincides, right, with the Attica uprising. And knowing that my relationship with these political prisoners, as well as those still in and formerly political prisoners as well. I remember um, George Jackson, just on the sidebar real fast, George Jackson said, we're all pr um, political prisoners. Everyone in this country because of, I'm paraphrasing, but um, just the, the political atmosphere that's going on, that we're all political prisoners. And knowing that I'm working with, say, Paul Dinga and Jahad and um, Jalil Muntakin, and these other like um, giants in this um in this movement is really something that I think we all should look up and look um look out for and continue to like to register and look up and um look into these people, look into their history, look into their cases, and really listen to your elders and sit by their front foot and get as much game as possible. That was just something that that was on my mind. I didn't I don't know if I mentioned the tribunal, but this is something really big that we're doing that we're charging genocide, genocide still happening, whether it was with the Attica 50 years ago, there's still people dying on the boat in the Bronx, as well as Rikers Island, there's deaths happening every other day. The COVID situation is the most deaths and it's happening inside the facilities, which makes sense because they're just in there with no, no masks, no cleaning supplies. Sometimes there's, the COs never show up, so they don't eat. There's so much going on inside these facilities that if we out here as outside organizers, it's so much an inside organizer can do. So it's really our job as outside organizers and educators and just people that has that have connections and influences to really um, bring highlight and bring awareness to what's going on inside these facilities. People are dying, whether it's through COVID or just other things, right? And on Rikers Island and then these other um, facilities inside the city, they're um, specifically trying to um, get people killed. And this is what I, I like to see this work, where there's street organizations, people are part of street organizations, and they're purposely splitting them and putting them in enemies' households. So, they, so this could continue to rise up the, um, the conflict and the uh, old um, the fighting and the cutting and everything that happens where money continue to get generated through these facilities because more, um, the most, um, more you get um, facility tickets and all these other um, infractions, the more money that goes into it, the more money your family has to spend. It costs $25 on Rikers Island just to, um, for a ticket. So this is constantly money that's being generated through these facilities. And we have to change the narrative that COBRA, the um, COs union, and all these other unions that's out here, we have to change the narrative that it's the COs that's going through it or the COs that's being oppressed, it, it doesn't make sense at all, right? It, we have to change this narrative and it takes us, right? The media, the abolition media, and all of us to continue to change this and continue to push it. Stay tuned October 22nd for the tribunal. We're gonna charge this country. Yeah, thanks so much, Kevin, for you know pointing out just all of the these instances of carceral violence and also for just drawing on George Jackson's legacy in kind of present day organizing work. Um, and also just, uh, you know, reminding us how uh, prominent the role of capital is underneath all of these um, just violent um, 
aspects of the prison system, just the, the reproduction of capital kind of undermines it all um, or under, yeah, it's underneath it all. Um, so yeah, does anyone have any final thoughts before we close out? Okay, well, thank you again, everyone. Um, and this record, this conversation will be recorded and posted so um, folks can access it um, on our YouTube channel moving forward. Thank you all. Thank you, yeah. free the land. Peace, y'all. Emily, I'll talk to you later. <laughs> Not tomorrow. I, we're probably still recording right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> See you later. Bye.